Okay, so I'm going to get started. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about lymphocyte activation. And just to put this in perspective, uh, signal transduction, the idea that there are receptors and cell surfaces actually came from the immune system. And the first person to think about this was the great Paul Ehrlich, who in 1895 postulated that immune cells had antibodies on the cell surface. And when they saw an antigen, the antibodies would signal to the cell, causing them to release more antibodies. So this whole idea of having cell surface receptors that signal actually came from studying the immune system. And today we realize that signaling is crucial in trying to understand almost any question in immunology. Uh, many of us now know that, you know, when you think about COVID-19 susceptibility, the entire pathway leading down from TLRs to the induction of type 1 interferons or the signaling pathway from the type 1 interferon, the receptors for type 1 interferons to what happens in a cell that is going to attain the antiviral state. All of those genes, which are all involved in signaling, are susceptibility genes for getting severe COVID-19. That's just one example. But most of us know that you, when you think about therapy today, we think about JAK inhibitors to inhibit cytokine signaling, or BTK inhibitors to inhibit B cell signaling, or drugs that will block calcium signaling for transplantation, for instance. So signal transduction plays a central role in the way we think about how we use immunology. But more than that, when you think of the biology of lymphocytes, it's the strength of the antigen receptor signaling that often determines fates. So just think about how you make a CD4 cell versus a CD8 cell that's closely linked to the strength of the T cell receptor that's signaling in the thymus. Similarly, how do you make a CD4 cell that becomes a, a thymic Treg? That's also linked to the strength of signaling. How do you choose between making T follicular helper cells that we'll talk about later today, or all the other T cell subsets that Andy will talk about? That's again linked to the strength of signaling. So these are all issues. The fundamental understanding of immunology only comes from understanding signal transduction. So in this lecture, what I'm going to cover are broad topics, immune receptor signaling, B cell signaling. We'll go back to this two signal hypothesis that we've talked about so often. We'll talk about the T cell receptor inhibitory signaling. And then although these giants of immunology don't know how important they are, I'll end with a tribute to Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. Okay, so uh, just to think about broad signaling categories, uh, all immune receptor signaling, I'll mention what immune receptors are in a minute, fall under the category of non-receptor tyrosine kinases. Here we have a receptor, some chain, either of the receptor itself or an associated chain has tyrosine residues, which can be phosphorylated, but the kinase that phosphorylates them is not part of the receptor. It is something that might be loosely associated with the receptor or with the membrane, but is a different molecule. So this category are called non-receptor tyrosine kinases. So all immune receptors, as well as the JAK-STAT pathway involve this kind of signal transduction. There are many receptor tyrosine kinases and receptor tyrosine kinases are receptors which have kinase domains in the cytoplasmic tail. These are tyrosine kinase domains. They phosphorylate targets and induce signaling. We have also nuclear hormone receptors, which are proteins that reside in the cytosol. They bind to their ligands, which are usually lipophilic across the membrane, bind to the nuclear hormone receptor, and will signal after this nuclear hormone receptor goes to the nucleus, functions as a transcription factor, and turns on gene expression or turns off gene expression. So if you think about insul the insulin receptor or the EGF receptor, it's a receptor tyrosine kinase. If you think about vitamin D3, or you think about steroids, these are all nuclear hormone receptors or thyroid hormones as well. Now, uh, then we have G protein coupled receptors. These are receptors that cross the membrane seven times, have these heterotrimeric G proteins associated with them. And so in the immune system, you think about chemokine receptors, they all fall into this category of GPCRs. And then we have, when we have the development of T cells, for instance, we have notch signaling, 
And so there's a ligand for notch on one cell, which engages notch, let's say on a developing T cell or a progenitor. Then this notch protein, which is a transmembrane protein, gets cleaved. Its cytoplasmic tail then it gets released where it functions as a, tr a transcription factor by going to the nucleus. So this is a very single, simple signaling pathway, just one protein providing the receptor and the transcription factor with no intermediate step other than a cleavage step. Okay. Now, immune receptors, this is a family of receptors, and all immune receptors will have some chain or chains that bind something, like the antigen receptor on B cells or T cells. Then they have associated chains, which will have tyrosine motifs in them called ITAMs. And this kind of structure is the fundamental basis of an immune receptor. And we'll talk about immune receptor signaling, which is very similar whether we think about the FC epsilon receptor type one or the B cell receptor. Ultimately, this is a very similar pathway downstream. Now, there are some receptors which contain tyrosine containing motifs, which do not activate signaling. So these do not recruit further tyrosine kinases that we'll talk about for the ITAM or the activating motifs. ITIMs will recruit tyrosine phosphatases typically, or inositol phosphatases. And then there are some proteins which have tails which contain ITSM or switch motifs. And in the immune system, those switch motifs theoretically can be both activating as well as inhibitory. We tend to think of the importance of these in an inhibitory context, though there are certainly contexts in which they're activating motifs as well. So these are motifs which are more plastic. They can either be activating or inhibitory. And there are sequences for all of them, which we can talk about. We will talk about items later. So how does the whole process work? The key is to have an adapter downstream of the receptor. And what the tyrosine kinases that the receptor are going to, is going to recruit are gonna do is to phosphorylate specific tyrosines. So you think of this adapter called LAT, and you think about, let's say there are four different tyrosines. The residues around each tyrosine are different in this protein. So each one of these tyrosines when phosphorylated is going to recruit, let's say a different enzyme. And each enzyme is going to start a different pathway with different transcription factors downstream. So here's just one example. Here is this particular tyrosine on LAT. When it's phosphorylated after T cell receptor activation, the phosphorylated tyrosine now has the ability to recognize a domain in a, a molecule here, which is PLC gamma. And PLC gamma is now going to be activated in part because it's going to be recruited to the membrane as well. And then it's going to turn on calcium signaling. Another pathway might turn on some other pathways, like you might have the ERK pathway turned on downstream of other molecules and so on. So you think of each pathway, it's going to start from a recruitment event following tyrosine phosphorylation of an adapter. Okay. Now, one more thing I want to give you in terms of background before we get into antigen receptors themselves is to consider PI3 kinase. So these are lipid kinases. So tyrosine kinase activation through the B cell receptor or the T cell receptor will activate a kinase called PI3 kinase. PI3 kinase will phosphorylate a phospholipid in the membrane with a inositol moiety with a couple of phosphates on it and convert it from PIP2 to PIP3. A number of signaling molecules, including BTK in B cells or ITK in T cells, have domains called pH domains, and they will be recruited to the membrane because they can bind to PIP3. Now, here is one classic example. I want to explain this just because it's so important when you have a cell proliferating, is that you have the recruitment to the membrane of both a kinase called PDK1, which gets activated, as well as its target, AKT, which is also recruited to the membrane, both by this PIP3 moiety. AK, AKT then gets phosphorylated by PDK1, it gets activated, and this will drive cell survival. So a lot of anti-apoptotic pathways will also drive cell growth through mTORC1. So the mTOR pathway allows the cell to grow and allows proliferation to occur. So this is a central event in any cell where tyrosine kinases activate many pathways, 
they also activate a lipid kinase. I just wanted to give you this example. It's not all tyrosine phosphorylation dependent. There are events downstream. And this key event of activating lipid kinases, like PI3 kinase, allows the cell to proliferate. And this becomes a target for immunosuppression as well. Okay. Now, just go, to, go into the biology. We're going to start with naive cells. So naive cells come into the lymph node through the high endothelial venue, and they're going to be brought in there by chemokines. So chemokines are going to help draw them in. So it's called, going to follow the three-step pathway. So naive B and T cells are going to keep coming here. And this is where all initial immune activation will occur. We don't have antigen activating a naive cell in a tissue. The naive cells do not migrate to the tissues. The naive cells come to lymph nodes. The antigen is brought to the lymph node and it activates the naive B and T cell in the lymph node or the spleen or the pious patch in a secondary lymphoid organ. So let me just talk briefly about T independent B cell activation and then I'm going to switch to T cell activation. So T independent B cell activation basically starts from the uh, B cell receptor. And there are two broad categories of B cell receptors. The IgM type of B cell receptor has these associated chains called Ig alpha and Ig beta, and they have ITAM motifs. The IgG type of uh, B cell receptor has the Ig alpha and Ig beta associated with it. So these have ITAMs, they're very important for signaling, but IgGs in addition have an additional motif in the tail which is called an Ig tail tyrosine motif. And this is also involved in signaling. So you have a much better signal transduction uh, effort being made by a memory B cell, which is IgG, which is gonna signal much faster in part because it's going to be helped by this Ig tail tyrosine motif. It's not just Ig alpha and Ig beta, which are gonna drive signaling. And Ig alpha and Ig beta have ITAM motifs they need to be phosphorylated. But just to start with, to put this into context as to what is a T-independent antigen. So when we think about a B cell and you think about the B cell receptor on the surface, if a small molecule came by and bound the B cell receptor, this small molecule can ligate the B cell receptor, it can bind it. And it can bind it very well, perhaps, if it has a good affinity, but there's going to be no signal induced. So we cannot initiate signaling from the B cell receptor, not effective, effectively, by just a small molecule binding to its receptor. However, if this smaller molecule was polymerized into a polysaccharide, so that now you have multiple moieties of the same moiety repeated multiple times, so that different parts of the same polysaccharide can bind different B cell receptors on the same cell, and cause them to cluster. And just bringing these cells together, these uh, B cell receptors together on the cell membrane will allow the activation of signaling. And basically you're gonna have now an orchestrated activation because many of the receptors can collaborate and this will allow signal transduction. So this kind of an antigen, any antigen which has the same determinant repeated many times, we call it a T independent antigen. So this could be a lipid membrane, it could be nucleic acid, it could be a polysaccharide, it could be a cell surface with the same protein repeated multiple times, but as long as it's multivalent, then it can cluster things together and cause signaling. So that's one example of an antigen. So we divide the world of antigens into haptins, and haptins are basically small molecules but they can't induce signal transduction. And then we have T independent antigens, which I've just talked about right now, uh, which are multivalent antigens. And then there are T dependent antigens, which are always proteins. And they're always proteins because they need to be presented to T cells. These are T dependent. And you know from Lisa's talk yesterday that you need to have peptides bound to MHC class two or class one in order to activate a T cell. So again, haptins by definition are small molecules or moieties. They are antigens, but they are not immunogens. Okay, and the basic rule here is all immunogens are antigens 
but all antigens are not immunogens. Okay? So just to give you a, a pictorial view of B cell activation, imagine that we have the B cell receptor, it has Ig alpha and Ig beta. The item motifs contain two specific tyrosines and I'll talk about the sequence of this. It's a well-known sequence for immunologists. And these two tyrosines, which are spaced about six or seven residues apart, uh, are going to be phosphorylated eventually by a SARC family kinase, shown over here. Uh, the SARC family kinase that we think about a lot in B cells is LIN. The SARC, one of the SARC family kinases we think of a lot in T cells is LCK. Now, in the B cell, this is going to phosphorylate these items. Now, you can imagine that this is, you know, think of a ceiling, look up for where you sit. And if you think in the ceiling, there's something protruding from the ceiling, but it's always there and then suddenly it changes shape. It gets a big bulge around it. So now there's something else waiting to bind to that new shape. And that's going to be this molecule called SICK, which has these two domains called SH2 domains. And the equivalent in T cells is gonna be ZAP70. If these two tyrosines get phosphorylated, there'll be new shapes created. The SICK will be recruited, it will be activated, and the B cell is going to take off. So just to show you this again, here's an antigen. We had clustering of the receptor. We then got phosphorylation of the item. So now we have these new bulges. SICK got recruited. SICK got activated. SICK then phosphorylated tyrosines on some adapters. And that is what's going to start off B cell signaling. Okay. Now, downstream, just as I mentioned, there are many pathways downstream. You could have the activation eventually of different transcription factors, which are downstream of different enzymes. So at the end of the day, you're gonna have lots of transcription factors induced because adapters allowed the recruitment of different enzymes and each enzyme started a different pathway. Okay? And we'll talk about one or two pathways when I come to T cells. So there is a co-receptor for B cells, for the B cell receptor, which is the complement receptor type two, which can, if you have an antigen that is coated with complement fragments, this is the C3D fragment. In that case, this core receptor comes close to the B cell receptor, brings with it tyrosine kinases, which can help activate the B cell receptor even more efficiently. So it turns out that a complement coated antigen can give you a thousand times stronger antibody response than a non complement coated antigen. And so this is one of the tricks that the B cell receptor is gonna use. Some people will think of this as a second signal where innate immunity through complement is helping adaptive immunity through the B cell receptor to combine together to provide signaling to T cells. Another way in which you can get a second signal for, for B cells is through a toll-like receptor. So you could have a PAMP from a microbe activating a toll-like receptor. The antigen from the microbe activates the B cell receptor. Both of these things happening together and they actually merge the signaling together. A lot of it is understood now in the molecular sense. And th these signaling pathways will merge and cause activation of the B cell. Okay, okay I'm gonna stop now, take a few questions if there are questions and possibly they're being answered. Okay. Um... Carrie, you can look as well. Um, here's one that hasn't been answered. Uh, sick phosphorylates or gets recruited to phosphorylated ITAMs. Uh, that's a question. Don't ITAMs autophosphorylate each other? That's a good question to clarify the- uh, Okay, ITAMs are not kinases. ITAMs are just two tyrosines. There's Y, X, X, L, then X, a few Xs, few more amino acids, then another Y, X, X, L. They're just two a, a motif with two tyrosine residues in them. What they are very good at uh, receiving is phosphorylation mediated by SARC family kinases. So SARC family kinases like items and they phosphorylate them. So as we'll see, the first step in signaling is going to be a SARC family kinase phosphorylating items. The moment the items are phosphorylated, so now you have two tyrosines in each item, you recruit sick or in the case of T cells ZAP70. This activates the downstream kinase, which is itself 
Now, the Sack family kinase is going to further phosphorylate the recruited sick or ZAP70 in the case of the T cell. And that is going to cause that the sick molecule or ZAP70 to be highly activated, phosphorylate tyrosines on different adapters, and then each of those phosphotyrosines might start another signaling pathway. So Shiv, there's another uh, fun question from Jesse that's a little bit more philosophical or evolutionary. Um, this person is asking you to speculate about why all immune receptors require an associated kinase. Um, is it just the cells being evolutionarily lazy or is there something else? Why, why don't they have intrinsic kinase activity, I think is the basis of the question. Well, I, I think so to have intrinsic kinase activity, uh, you need to have a protein which has cytoplasmic tails with kinase domains. You could think of this as an evolutionary trick where maybe by some duplication event, you use the same machinery, you use the same chain. So as you learned yesterday, some of the chains used in the, uh, the FC receptor for IgE are used by NK cells, okay? Some of the chains that are associated with different receptors are used by all of them. So these uh, possibilities of being modular and using the same modules time and time again with maybe just a different recognition receptor might have been an evolutionary trick. So that's my you know, speculative answer, which nobody can prove. So, um... I, there's a question here that uh, looks uh, ahead in, in the course, but it's a good one to address briefly now. If there is any mutation related to any protein involved in lymphocyte signaling, would it result in a primary immunodeficiency disease? It's a good advertisement for a lecture coming up. Well, Carrie's going to talk about that too, but yes, of course. I mean, the classic example is a BTK mutation will give you no B cells because you or reduce the number of B cells because BTK is required, as I'll talk about later, today for pre-BCR signaling itself. So yes, there are many such examples. Everything, every pathway we think about is there in some disease or the other, mutated in some form. Okay, any more or should we move on? Um, I'll give you one more, Shiv. So Alicia asked if CR2 or TLRs can overcome the need for antigens to multimerize and make a T-dependent antigen more like T-independent? So the reality is that if I had a protein antigen, for sure, this is going to help it a lot. I can't do this with, so you, I can't have uh, a small molecule, which will have not enough room to have complement attached to it, as well as to bind to the, uh, to the antigen receptor. So yes, if this is a polysaccharide, I can increase signaling by adding complement. Or if it's a protein, I can enhance signaling by attaching complement. But for a small molecule, uh, it's just not stru structurally possible to do that. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. So uh, all great questions, and I'm happy to take more later on. So now I'm gonna talk about T cell activation. Let's just go a little bit with the biology first. So we've talked, uh, there've been multiple mentions of the two signal hypothesis. So let's say we start with the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell, we have drawn it over here with no B7 on the surface. So this little thing here is B7. It's gonna be some B7 already. It's a dendritic cell after all. It's gonna ingest a protein antigen. A microbe comes by, protein from the microbe gets ingested. It's gonna get presented on class two, let's assume for, for now. And the TLR is gonna be activated on the cell. And one of the things that's gonna happen as a, as a result is the induction of a chemokine receptor. This is CCR7. So now this dendritic cell is gonna be pulled into the nearest lymphatic because there's a gradient of the cytokines, CCL19 and CCL21 for, CC, for CCR7. So now the dendritic cell is gonna be going all the way towards the nearest lymph node. Now it also will express more B7, which is gonna be important for it. It's gonna enter the afferent lymphatic of the lymph node, and then it's gonna make its way to the T cell zone because the gradient of CCL19 and CCL21 is coming from FRC, from stromal cells sitting in the T cell zone. So that this guy is gonna come all the way, carrying its antigen, carrying its B7 uh, to the T cell zone. Here you're gonna have a dendritic cell ligate a naive T cell, give it its two signals through, one signal is for foreignness, through the T cell receptor, 
The other signal says I came from a land of danger. There was a pathogen. That's why I have so much B7 on me. And then it activates the T cell and the T cell proliferates. And then the proliferating T cells eventually will get a signal to say, leave the lymph node and go eventually into the bloodstream and go back to a tissue, okay? So if you think about this, this is just signal one, signal two, an expansion. And then we have, there's another view of it. There's signal one alone. Again, as we've mentioned, there will be some B7 on the DC. It is a DC. You have more signal two, you get both signals. The T cell is now fully activated. So once a T cell is activated, it's going to express on its surface, maybe after a little bit of time, it's going to express a protein called CTLA-4. And CTLA-4 will fall into a category of proteins we'll call inhibitory receptors, except for this is not really a signaling molecule. The CTLA-4 has a much higher affinity for B7. So by binding, so if this was CD28, which is the co-stimulatory receptor, which is being ligated by B7, signal two, the CTLA-4 is going to displace the B7, and you're now not going to get signal two because CD28 is no longer binding to B7. So after T cell activation, you can dampen signaling in part by the activated T cell expressing CTLA-4, which just by its high affinity is going to displace uh, the uh, CD28 from binding B7. Now, regulatory T cells, which Mark talked about yesterday, have a lot of CTLA-4 on the surface. And the CTLA-4 does have a function on the surface. And if you mutate CTLA-4, you're, you, know, you have a defect in T-Rex. Now CTLA-4, what it does is to bind on a dendritic cell. When there's a dendritic cell primed to activate any T-cell, the T-Reg, because it's CTLA-4, can bind to B7 with such high affinity, it can grab the B7, take it off the membrane, and ingest it. And this process is called transendocytosis. And as a result, that dendritic cell, which was primed to go and activate naive T cells, is now no longer capable of doing so. Because even if it still had the antigenic peptide, it's lost its B7, which has been stripped from its surface unceremoniously by CTLA-4. So that is one function of CTLA-4, where again, this is not a signaling function, but it's a competition function and a function of stripping a cell or emasculating it by taking off its B7, okay? Once the T cell is activated, when the T cell came into the lymph node, it down-regulated a receptor for a lipid molecule that exists in the blood and in the efferent lymphatics, and that's a lipid called sphingosine 1-phosphate. After the T cell is activated, it's going to now be allowed to re-express the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, and it's going to be drawn out of the T cell, uh, drawn out of the lymph node into the efferent lymphatic by following the scent of sphingosine 1-phosphate. And now this lymphocyte is going to leave, it's going to go into a tissue site, and then migrate into the tissue to, to deal with the pathogen that activated it. So the T cell receptor, the key thing to remember about the T cell receptor is that it's a modular receptor with 10 items. And the 10 items gives it the capacity to signal through, let's say, th maybe through eight items and have strong signaling, or through two items and have weaker signaling, or an intermediate number of items and have you know, intermediate signaling. And by this modularity of signaling, you can have different fates for the T cell. So this is just a picture of uh, an APC and a T cell. You have the T cell receptor is made up of t the alpha beta chain, which are recognition chains, the gamma and epsilon heterodimer, and the delta and epsilon heterodimer, which each have one item. And then you have a zeta dimer, a homodimer, each with three items. So you ended up with 10 items. And this is just another structural view where the, there's some models of crystal structures showing you how CD4, if this was a helper T cell, the CD4 molecule is going to come and bind to the side of the MHC class two molecule on the APC. And this CD4 is therefore 
going to be able to bring on its tail a tyrosine kinase, a SAC family tyrosine kinase called LCK close to the T cell receptor. So we're going to have interaction of the T cell receptor with MHC and peptide. And then you're going to have CD4 coming in the plane of the membrane and saying, I can recognize something here and binding to the MHC class two molecule, thus bringing a tyrosine kinase close by and initiating signaling by phosphorylating these items. So here we have a clear example of the co-receptor, whether it's CD4 or CD8 in, the CD, in, a, in a killer T cell, what will eventually be a killer T cell. In both cases, it's going to bring the tyrosine kinase close to the antigen receptor because it can bind to the same antigen complex that the antigen receptor sees, fulfilling the definition of a co-receptor. So this is just showing you again, what are the, uh, uh, there are many ligand receptor pairs of importance. You have adhesion molecules, you have B7 and CD28, you have CETA, the class two MHC in this case, presenting peptide to the T cell receptor. And the T cell receptor has all these associated chains, but CD4 is crucial to activate signaling through a T cell receptor on a helper T cell. Uh, once again, this is just to tell you how signaling is initiated in the T cell receptor. We said CD4 or CD8 is gonna come and bind to the side of the MHC. The MHC and the peptide are going to be seen by the T cell receptor. This brought LCK close to the items. LCK now phosphorylates the items and the T cell is going to signal. This is how you initiate signaling. Once you have phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues on the item. So each of the items can recruit one ZAP70 molecule. And remember that ZAP70 is homologous to SIC. So once you have these tyrosine kinases with two SH2 domains, you now have recruitment of this tyrosine kinase to these two uh, phosphor phosphorylated tyrosines, activation of ZAP70 because it gets further phosphorylated by LCK. And then the activated ZAP70 is the, the key player, which is now going to phosphorylate tyrosines on adapters and drive signaling in the cell. So we have first a SARC family kinase like LCK, which is then phosphorylates items. We then have a sick family kinase like ZAP70 get recruited to the items. Once it is activated, the T cell is going to take off. And this is just telling you, okay, there are different pathways. Here we have a pathway, either you can have the activation of MAP kinase pathways via RAS activation, you can have PLC gamma activation for calcium signaling, and there are different transcription factors. In this case, you're gonna have different transcription factors coming downstream of uh, this pathway compared to what's happening through PLC gamma. Okay. And again, just to give you some examples, the 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 uh, MAP kinase pathways, a couple of them coming together, will make a transcription factor called AP1, which is made of FOS and JUN. Calcium signaling will activate a transcription factor called NFAT, because calcium signaling will activate a phosphatase that will dephosphorylate NFAT, allow it to go to the nucleus. PKC will activate NF kappa B, and there are other ways to activate NF kappa B as well. NF kappa B will go to the nucleus. When all of these transcription factors go and bind to the promoter of some target gene, and IL-2 is just given as an example, now this promoter is going to fire, the gene is going to be turned on, the T cells are going to make IL-2, it's going to be able to proliferate, okay? Okay, I'll stop and take a few questions if you have any right now, and then if you don't, I'll keep moving on. Well, the team has been really great at answering questions. Which is wonderful. That's all good. If everyone is clear, that's good. If you think there's anything that would be helpful for everyone to hear, I'll mention it. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Did, there was one um, where Oslam asked, why are B cells and T cells in separate locations in the lymph nodes? What's the advantage? Yeah, so the, well, I'm going to talk about this in a later lecture, but essentially it's crucial to have the cellular apartheid separating T cells and B cells from each other so that only when antigen comes by and activates a specific B cell and a specific T cell, will they leave everyone else and go and meet each other? And then maybe the T cell will activate the B cell. And we were gonna spend a whole lecture on this, but 
it, just to understand that if you want specificity, you want to ensure specificity in multiple ways. So you keep apart everything else so you don't have random activation of T cells by T cells of B cells, which would happen if you just had an activated T cell running amok among different B cells. Just by making sure you only allow the key players to meet each other is how you get much more specificity. Okay, there's a couple of questions that have come in while you were talking. Uh, one about Tregs, does that use the same mechanism to get activated and migrate through uh, local tissues? Um, I assume that same as effector T cells is what the question is. Yeah, so as uh, Mark mentioned yesterday, Tregs do have T cell receptors and the T cell receptor is essential for Tregs. And we also know that antigen is essential for making Tregs in the thymus. But usually it's really hard to pinpoint what the antigen the Treg sees. So in, in reality, a lot of Tregs are being created in the gut when you think about uh, the peripheral Tregs or induced Tregs. They are, most of them are coming from the gut, which is a great site to make Tregs. And then they might function in different sites after that and enter those sites with the same inflammatory signals, bringing them there. So there's some differences, there's some things we don't understand about Tregs. And please jump in, Andy or Terry, if you think you want to say something differently. I think the, the, the biochemical hookup of T cell receptors and Tregs is fundamentally the same. It's just the gene transcription program downstream. That's yeah, nice. absolutely. Uh, Carrie, there are a few more. Do you want to pick one or do you want me to? Sure. There was um, Monica asked a question to clarify the role of CD3. Is it just a marker on T cells or it has a role in signaling? No, so if you remember, I mean, I'm going through these things fairly quickly, but if you remember, CD3 is made up of gamma epsilon and delta epsilon. Gamma and epsilon each and delta each have an item in the tail. CD3 is not a marker of T cells. We use it as a marker of T cells. CD3 exists in order to allow the T cell receptor to signal, as does zeta. I would consider zeta functionally with CD3, they're just one complex. And in that complex, the signaling chains are CD3 chains and zeta. Here's a very biochemical question that you'll like. Um, I know tyrosine side chains are hydrophobic. Are conformational changes required for ITAM phosphorylation? So uh, for ITAM phosphorylation, I don't think there's, so what we understand about how signaling occurs through the T cell receptor and this is probably the best model right now, is that there is mechanical pushing of the inside of the T cell, uh, of the T cell receptor. When the T cell receptor engages antigen, there's a mechanical shifting, there's a force transmitted. So yes, uh, I don't know if you will strictly call it a conformational change, but the items, the item creating chains tend to be associated with in the inside of the membrane and that force pushes them outwards so that now the items are exposed inside the cell. So you could consider that conformational and that exposure of the items, basically because of this force being applied on the T cell receptor, allows them to be exposed for LCK to phosphorylate them. Okay, and this is very nice work from one of our colleagues, uh, Kai Vukafenik, uh, addressing this issue and others. She has okay. another question. Sure. Why does affinity maturation, why is it only applicable for BCR but not TCR despite their similar diversity generation process? I mean, I don't want to get into a class discussion of which cells have superior abilities here. Uh, you <laughs> can't have affinity maturation without T cells. We're going to have a whole lecture on it so we can come back to that a little later this afternoon. Yeah. But yes, definitely it's only in B cells, not in T cells. Uh, I think I'll go on and uh, then you can come back with more questions. Okay, so this is something again, I, I put this out there because there's still mysteries associated with this. So every time a T cell engages an APC or a T cell, a killer T cell or an NK cell engages a target, it forms this beautiful structure called a synapse. This is an immunological synapse. And in this structure, there are some smaller proteins in the middle of the synapse, I mean, there's a lot of cytoskeletal rearrangement going on after signaling. And the larger proteins, the adhesion molecules and the, some of the tyrosine phosphatases, uh, the receptor tyrosine phosphatases, 
are in the outer ring. So you have an inner ring and an outer ring. So you have this beautiful structure forming and this tight adhesion. And these cells are going to stay associated with one another for a while to signal. Whether this is essential for signaling or is essential for stopping signaling is highly debated still. What it is essential for is specificity of target recognition. So when a T activated T cell sees a target, you want to a CD8 killer to give perforin and granzyme only to the target cell, not to random cells around it. So the immune specificity is mediated very strongly by the synapse. How exactly the synapse is modulating the activation or the deactivation of a T cell is, as I said, still somewhat debated and with very different views. Okay, let's take a picture of the synapse where you have these longer, bigger molecules on the outside and the smaller molecules in the middle, including the T cell receptor. There's a redistribution. So you have lipid drafts that coalesce to form a synapse. And this is one of the beautiful structures that happens during immune activation. It certainly gives us a lot of immune specificity. And then in the last bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about inhibitory signals and inhibitory signaling. So we have in general, so the items were YXXL, X6 or seven, YXXL where Y is a tyrosine and L is a leucine or you could have an isoleucine. If you have a couple more residues in front of it, and these are, you know, uh, I don't need to recite it for you, but essentially you have one amino acid, then a, a non amino acid is typically hydrophobic. Then you have a little uh, in a space cell amino acid, and then what looks like half an item is now an item. And a phosphorylated item will recruit an SH2 domain in a molecule which is going to be inhibitory. So, in, in case of tyrosine phosphatases, contain SH2 domains which get recognized by phosphorylation of items. So the yin and yang here is phosphorylation of the items recruits a strong tyrosine kinase like ZAP70 or SIC and activates the T cell. Tyrosine phosphorylation of an item then recruits a strong tyrosine phosphatase, which gets recruited and then binds to this guy, gets activated, and then it's going to dephosphorylate a lot of the targets of the tyrosine kinase. And this is how you're going to dampen signaling. What goes up must come down. You know, everything has to have a yin and yang. You have to have coming back to homeostasis. And this is one such mechanism, which is very important. Now, you heard yesterday about curves uh, from Lewis in NK cells, which the inhibitory curves all have items uh, uh, to dampen signaling. FC gamma R2B is an inhibitory receptor in B cells and in dendritic cells and in other myeloid cells. And it's very important when you think about IV, IG treatment, eventually you want to activate FC gamma R2B and it can dampen signaling in all these cells. It uses an item. PD-1 in T cells has switch motifs and items. And I'll mention the switch motif again and dampen signaling uh, through use of the switch motif to recruit a tyrosine phosphatase. So this is just saying in B cells, you have this, pro this receptor called FC gamma R2B. If I have had a big immune response, I made an immune complex, the antigen in the immune complex binds to the B cell receptor, it's a positive signaler. The IgG binds to the FC gamma R2B receptor. This one contains an item in this case, FC gamma R2B does not recruit a tyrosine phosphatase. It recruits an inositol phosphatase called SHIP. And if you remember, we talked about PIP2 and PIP3. What SHIP will do is to convert PIP3 to PIP2 and dampen signaling. So in the B cell, I mean, you could have had a tyrosine phosphatase as you have for some other inhibitory receptors. In this case, it's a SH2 domain containing inositol phosphatase, which is going to dampen signaling. Okay. And here is PD-1. I just want to remind you, these are all inhibitory receptors. PD-1 has both ITIM and ITSM. This has been debated for a long time. I think there are now beautiful in vivo studies showing the ITSM or the, the switch motif is actually the key to recruiting SHIP2, the tyrosine phosphatase. So the biology of this, which, will, which Stephanie Dugan will get into again in more detail, I just want to give you a broad view is you have some stem-like progenitors 
created during T cell activation. If you have ligation of PD1 and uh, by PDL1, in this context, the cell might be pushed towards an exhaustion phenotype. If you reverse the step, you allow the cell now to go the normal path to become an effector memory T cell. And someone asked yesterday, is it effector or memory? That was a question in the chat, I saw it. But you know, in, in humans, we can't even distinguish the two. And the effector memory cells have very similar phenotypes, uh, but the, these cells, some of them will be memory, some of them will be pure effectors. Okay, okay so I'm going to stop sharing now and maybe uh, share something else with you. So this is really a measure of how much you know about American popular culture. And I mentioned two important characters at the beginning. They were uh, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. And one day they may know that they are icons in the world of immunology, at least for a small handful of uh, dispersed people like you and me. Okay. My noble cousin expresses CD4. He is a veritable cytokine store, but a DC has come hither and he's ready to go. His CD40 ligand, he just loves to show. <clears throat> My cousin's promiscuous hits on passers by, kisses the wrong B cells, then tells them to die. The right BCR can give fast the slip, shuts off gas space eight by turning on flip. I grew up a cell of the CD8 kind. I was naive and aimless, bored out of my mind. I wandered like a cloud from node to node. CCL21 determined my abode. Along came a virus, infected the liver. Hepatitis B can sure make you shiver. My DC friends, each picked up a sliver and in the lymph node, I started to quiver. Is this the feeling that Ben had for Jen? Or when Romeo saw Juliet again and again, peptide and class one and then some B7, I leap in delight and in course terminatory heaven. I'm no longer a boring CD8 cell. I'm a killer now, baby. A real CTL. No fleeting feelings like Jen had for Ben. I proliferate like crazy again and again. The liver beckons to me and my brothers as well. We each form a synapse with an infected cell. With perforins and granzymes, the little clefts we fill. Oh, what passion to lock lips, but kill. Passion we have now, but once we did grieve. For siblings lost, forced to take their leave. They perished at the double positive stage. Cell structures they did strongly engage. They made some BIM and then felt weak. Their mitochondria started to leak. Cytochrome C bound to APAF1. Caspase 9 began to hum. We wept, but they chose not to fight. They vanished quietly into the night. And now I think I have a few more minutes. We can take some more questions if you have any more and uh, ha happy to address them. Um, there are a few that haven't been answered, although again, the team has been great. Um, so one, I'm not sure anybody answered this. Amir uh, wanted to know about how long the immune synapse has to uh, stay in place in order to confer strong activation of T cells. In other words, what's okay. the There's actually an interesting paper that was published many years ago by uh, Thorsten Mempel and Uli von Andrian, where they looked at different stages of T cell activation, where they actually followed sets of T cells and dendritic cells bound to each other. And they found that the strongest activation came when these cells stayed bound to each other for about 12 hours. So you do have uh, you know, the case for saying 
the cells need to stay together for a long time. And that uh, maybe the synapse helps them stay together. So there is that kind of evidence. Uh, beyond that, you know, we don't have anything else to say. We, we don't know whether the synapse stayed intact. How did they stay together? Was it by the synapse? We know that the cells stuck together and hung around for a long time in vivo. So there's oh. another question that's been part of, answered by a few people in the chat, but they're curious, uh, your answer for why vaccines are good at provoking antibody responses, but potentially not so great at provoking T cell responses, for example, in COVID. So I actually would dispute that statement. So uh, especially for the, the spike, the mRNA vaccines for spike, obviously we do want to get antibody responses. Uh, you want neutralizing antibodies. That is how you're going to protect yourself from infection. But all these vaccine makers also wanted to make some CD8 responses, which because CD8 T cells will help you clear virally infected cells. Whether CD8 responses actually protect you or help you only after you're infected is something we should consider. But I would think, yes, after you get infected, CD8 T cells are the key to getting rid of uh, infection. But for protection from the virus, probably antibodies are better. So we focused a lot more on antibodies for that reason. The reality is that all the studies with the Moderna vaccine that I've followed closely also make very good CTLs. So you get, even for spike, you get good CTLs. Now, obviously, if you use more proteins on the virus, you would have even more CTLs because there's going to be some more epitopes to look at. And, you know, there's always the concern of, do I get the MHC class one for everybody with just using spike? All these issues could come up, but you do make CTLs. And that's been shown. But I also think the point should be made, and obviously um, it's clear that if you have a good antibody response with uh, isotype switch high affinity antibodies, you've had a good helper T cell response, right? So <laughs> I think that's part of what uh, a couple of us addressed that, that these vaccines, you measure the antibody, but you've had to act, had a good activation in germinal center reactions and stuff. Yes, everything is polytheistic in the world. Nothing happens on its own. Without T cells, B cells are useless and vice versa. So, you know, I think everything works together. Um, there are lots of uh, um, nice comments about your poems, Shiv. I, I'm sorry, that's all to irritate Abul, email. that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Send them to Abul, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, if there are any scientific questions, I'm happy to answer anymore. Yeah. So one from a bit earlier, Shiv, is a question about how does immobilized anti-CD3 enable recruitment of LCK? So, okay, so immobilized, uh, so that clearly uh, you can get T cell activation without having to recruit CD4, okay? This can happen, it does happen. Uh, remember that, the, I didn't get into that much detail, there's some fin, T fin also associated with the T cell receptor. So there's at least two, uh, Sark family tyrosine kinases that are linked to T cell receptor signaling. So FIN is somewhat like what uh, LIN is doing in B cells, where it's associated with the ITAM containing chains. So if I just clustered T cell receptors, I would probably get enough FIN mediated activation, and that's only good enough. Okay, and maybe LCK can come into play as well. But LCK, yes, the best activation comes from using the core receptor. So physiologically, I would think core receptors are key to initiating activation. Uh, Carrie, Carrie, do you see any more? Um, well, you guys have done a wonderful job. I, you know. Oh, here, wait, here's a good question, actually. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a good one, because I know there's a lot of confusion in the way people talk about it. In what category does CD40 fall? Is it a... Well, actually the question there is, is it a TNF receptor? I was going to expand on that question. Is CD4040 ligand co-stimulation or not? Which- Yeah, that's a, so I don't like to call it co-stimulation, but it is helping eventually provide the second signal to the B cell in a T-dependent immune response. If you want to consider it in that broad teleological sense that a B cell is required. In fact, without CD40, a T-dependent B-cell response will not occur, okay? So a T-dependent B-cell response absolutely needs CD40, where you might even say most of the signaling is coming from there and not from the B-cell receptor, okay? So there's some differences and we will talk about this again. 
later today in about a couple of hours time. But uh, definitely, uh, I would not like to call it a co-stimulator. I like to strict, to strict definitions where co-receptor is always something that binds through the same antigen with the antigen receptor sees. A co-stimulator is providing the second signal. But then CD40, you could vaguely say it is the co-stimulator for T-dependent B-cell activation, uh, which is you know, a multi-step process. It's not happening simultaneously with the B-cell receptor. And just very quickly, because this was in the question, CD40 is in the family of TNF receptors and the ligand, CD40 ligand in the family of TNF molecules. That's just protein homologies and similar signaling, but it's not TNF or, or TNF receptor, it's different. Oh yes, I mean, the TNF receptor family is vast and it includes things like FAS, which can cause cell death, TNF receptor type one, which in some contexts will cause cell death. TNF receptor type two, which might help a T cell, you know, so many different functions, CD40, BAF, which keeps your B cell alive, the BAF receptor. So all of these are in the same family. It's just a family that's structurally related with very different functions. Shiv, there was a question about anergic phenotypes and whether anergic cells could be reactivated. Yeah, so, the, so in, in the B lineage, energy is best defined in certain transgenic mouse models. And once you make those models into knock-in models, that energy phenotype actually disappeared. So the energy phenotype that we know about comes from the hen egg lysozyme uh, transgenic mouse model, where exposure to the antigen repeatedly, so you have a mouse which has every B cell has got the receptor for hen egg lysozyme, the same mouse is making hen egg lysozyme through a cross, and then you have constant activation of the B cell receptor repeatedly. And in the at case, the B cells become unhappy and we call that phenomenon energy, okay? This is a fairly artificial phenomenon. It may occur in reality. In real life, we don't know that it does. However, if you use a knock-in model and you use the same BCR, which was knocked in. So it was in the exact locus for the immunoglobulin genes. So that now you cannot, what you can do now is that every time you get the signal, and I'll talk about this in the, in the next lecture, you're going to have receptor editing. You're going to change the light chain of the B cell. In that context, you don't get energy. So I think the physiological thing is, I'm not sure energy is real physiologically for B cells. And the, the model in which it was shown, if I was thinking of it in a normal human, it would not cause energy. It would cause receptor editing. Okay. We are doing good for time, Andy. Take note of that, all right? That, uh... <laughs> can, I, can I start five minutes earlier? <laughs> you can start. There'll be no one there. <laughs> Shiv, I do see one more that might be worth addressing. There's a question okay. about um, physical proximity to the synapse when thinking about co-receptors and co-stimulatory receptors. H how do they get to the right place? So... Uh, the way you should think about it is that both the co-receptor and the co-stimulatory receptor are going to be in the middle of the synapse, okay? And how things get into the right place is, is somewhat based on size distribution here and reorganization of the membrane. So there is this need for cytoskeletal rearrangement and there's some signaling involved in this. And then you're redistributing the larger proteins to the outside so that the lengths of those protein is well understood. So the outside of the synapse is further apart for the two cells. The inside of the synapse is closer for the two cells. And since the T cell receptor is in the middle, all of the signaling is happening there, but the inhibitory phosphatase, CD45, has gone to the outside of the synapse. Okay, so that's the way I would think about it. So yes, both signal one, signal two are coming from the middle. So this is related to that question, and I don't know how much, uh, I can't remember whether Mark covered this, but CD28, the question is about its signaling. What happens intracellularly with CD28? Uh, I think what- So, so I think a simple way to think about CD28 is that it is not that unique compared to the T cell receptor. Uh, it might be slightly better in a couple of things like PL3 kinase activation, but even the T cell receptor on its own can give you some 
PS3 kinase activation. So it's somewhat more of a magnitude effect that might come about from using both these receptors. And it's not, it would have been beautiful at one time, there were many people suggesting this, if there were some unique synergies coming together. It's not, so far, nothing that unique allows you to discriminate between the two. Uh, clearly, there's some pathways that only come through the T cell receptor uh, or much more strongly. For instance, uh, you know, I, I think of the activation of uh, even ERK being much more strong through the, the T cell receptor. And I think of maybe PI3 kinase being stronger through CD28, but nothing's unique. Well, it's 1230. And okay, very good. We take a break now and we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>